we're, we seem to be demanding much, much more out of the performance of our buildings. So things need to span longer, do more, they need to collect rainwater, harvest energy, blah, blah, blah. So we're putting all this pressure on structure. How does that fit with this kind of idea of uh, a purity of expression when we're demanding so much more from all of these systems? Well, I think it means economy, for one thing. If you have minimal, um, you do affect an, an economy of that, and therefore it works towards what we, what we loosely describe as sustainability these days, that you are trying to um, maximise the use of materials. You're not squandering materials. You, you are using the whole of the structure, whether it's a, a living, breathing environment or whatever, in a responsible um, environmental way today. So all the pressures of trying to reduce energy, trying to reuse the water, trying to minimise the structural content, you know, not make the cladding more expensive than it has to be, but make the, the building breathe and work with its environment you know, the best way. Actually, they're all going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there are conflicts in there. I think it's, it's all one, one journey and one path. And actually, coming back to your earlier question, I think that's where the borrowing from nature and biomimicry movement is also coming from. Mm -hmm. There's a fundamental belief that nature's been at this game much longer than we have. You know, and has evolved and developed huge numbers of techniques and, and methods of being efficient. And it's really beholden on us to actually look at nature and say, well, how can we be more efficient you know, in, in man-made structures utilising you know, what nature has developed? Given that that ambition requires a much more seamless integration of all the different coordinating services and consultants and lead designers and so on, how do you see that affecting practice then? Do you see a new practice evolving where the traditional disciplines tend to break down and become more of a, a collaborated and integrated team? Or do you think that we'll just find ways to communicate better? One of the problems I have on the engineering side of the fence is that the, the greatest, most nu numerate engineers like, actually hate people. Mm -hmm. right? So they don't want to collaborate. They want to step, they want to be given a problem like a crossword puzzle and go and solve that crossword puzzle. They don't want to ask other people for the answers. And I think on the other side of the fence is that there's a, 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 a branch of architecture that also don't want to be challenged into why they're producing what they're producing. They just want to say they perhaps slightly lack self-confidence in you know, the form that they've come up with. And they certainly don't want to be challenged by some engineer saying, well, why are you trying to do that? You know, in what way is that going to help the planet? So what we're talking about is happening it's, I wouldn't say it's a, a revolution, I think it's an evolution because mm. there are all sorts of personal traits uh, amongst people as to why they actually prefer working the way mm. they work together for a long time. When I was going through university, it was, a, I suppose, a more, um, there was more emphasis on, on the engineering component. I mean, we had to work out you know, concrete buildings and steel buildings, although that one never does it, and certainly you know, we understood the mathematics of, of how and why and certainly we were introduced to new techniques of, of structure. You could though speculate that maybe in 30, 40, 50 years time the need for even engineers to understand mathematics will evaporate. Mm -hmm. you know, you, I wonder you know, how much maths needs to be taught at secondary schools when people use their computers, laptops and you know, all the devices to add up far more quickly than people do. And if I extrapolate that into the, the world of structural engineering, will we have tools where uh, effectively I build with virtual Lego and can put things together? And the machine will tell me whether what I'm building will stand up, fall down, how much energy it will consume, what it will cost, how much, etc. You know, it will give me sort of you know, continuous feedback mm. on my exploration, at which point do I need to be a structural engineer? I would disagree with that in a certain extent, although I agree with the the prophecy of, yes, the computer will, will have uh, a tabulation that you can feed whatever material and you'll get an answer out of it. But that doesn't acknowledge the creative process. It doesn't understand that the human mind is still responsible to receiving information, to digesting that information, and to coming up with the initial approach to what that um, solution might be. It's done through feeling, mm -hmm. it's done through emotions, it's done through intellect and all the rest of it, and only that is synthesised in the human brain. After that, if you can't feel the structure in some way, or what you're doing, what form it is, or is it, the computer is quite useless to you. But the, after that has been sensed and felt, yes, of course you can go through that process. So you don't see a big role in computationally generative design, rather sort of computationally analytical 
type of design relationship. Is that right? Uh, in in some respects. Uh-huh. In some respects. Well, I've, I've probably, I see quite a lot of the you know, future of competency generative design. In fact, uh-huh. the, the um, DNA bridge in Singapore, for example, uh, we, we, we'd, we'd struggled for a long time, I think, together, maybe a year and a half on that design. In the end, we went back to base and said, what is it? We thought, you know, and, and this is the, the feeling side I think Philip's talking about, is that Philip said strongly to me uh, that, the, that, the, that the spiral elements of our, the schemes we produce today were the ones that were, were visually powerful and emotional and things that people could react to. And, but then, I actually, a spiral is not a structure. Mm. Okay? And it occurred to me one, one morning that two spirals opposite each other might be a structure. And then, notice that word might. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not, in my own head, competent with any number of calculations done by hand or sketches on pieces of paper able to actually answer the question, can it be made competent? Mm-hmm. So in that case, I went into a virtual environment and, and tried putting the two spirals <coughs> in a way that would work. And when it doesn't, didn't work, you just keep trying and keep trying. You learn from each failure. I think that the arguments which uh, uh, Tristan and I have, and you know, is saying, let's, let's, it looks too heavy, it's wrong, you know, can we change the shape to, re- to reduce member sizes? Can we do this? Can we do that? <clears throat> so it's a give and take between us and saying, interpreting what they're doing and, and they interpreting what we're doing so we get uh, a synthesis between the two attitudes. Mm-hmm. Tristan Bridges is our engineer's maker. Long span bridges, yeah, ultimately, if you're going to do a kilometre long uh, suspension bridge or coverside bridge, then there, are, yeah, there aren't that many variations on a the theme that will do it with reasonable economy. But when you come to you know, 100 metre spans, 200 metre spans, pedestrian foot bridges, there are a wealth of possibilities. And again, the, the danger of an engineer working on their own is they'll go straight down the tried and tested. You know, we know this works, this will do the job. In the end, it's a functionality criteria, let's get on with it. But together, you know, we can blend that with the whole idea of experience and civic. And I think you can go further. I, I could say that all infrastructure, not just buildings and the old pedestrian approach, would be better if engineers and architects work together. I mean, these are very experimental projects. How do you, how do you manage risk? And one of the ways we deal with it, I think, as an organisation is we tend to take as much risk as we can out of everything else. We, we don't borrow money, um, we don't, we're not you know, entrepreneurial, if you like, on our commercial fronts. We're very conservative in the way we operate, we look after each other, we share, we do all sorts of things, almost to allow us to focus you know, almost exclusively and specifically on the technical risk and feel that everything else is, is, is being dealt with. You know? mm. So it's an environment, a comfortable environment, that you're in to begin with, so that you can concentrate on that. But it does frustrate me a bit that some engineers will spend more time on, on de-risking a project and mm-hmm. making it 99.9999999% reliable, when actually 99% reliable is probably sufficient. Probably okay. No, I think that that's where the architect comes in, where they have a factor of 10 on their, on their structures. Where we, <laughs> we believe that it should be much less. But again, that's where the virtual, coming back to the beginning of the conversation, it is where the virtual environment will change things. Mm. We can assess far more risk now than ever before, mm. and in the future that will develop you know, to a much greater extent. So I, hopefully, you know, the virtual environment, the ability to do performance assessments on the fly, this thing that I was talking about earlier for 40 or 50 years hence, mm. that will allow us all to be far more creative. Mm. Although there is an issue, I think, as Philip's saying, is to what extent does a digital virtual world get connected to your gut, your heart and your emotions, mm. or to what extent is it an intellectual exercise?